Welcome back to your high school gym. Glad, glad to have you all here today. Uh, I don't know, Stephen, I mean, maybe that was your least favorite time in life. I would have had to say junior high, but, uh, but uh, we're happy to have you here for this uh, three-week sermon series for fun that we're doing called Homecoming. We're looking at different homecoming stories in the Bible. When I started to think about this, there are dozens of stories of homecoming in the Bible. I mean, so many of them, it was hard to narrow it down to just a few of them. So we're going to look at uh, a few different stories over the next couple of weeks and look at ones that I think are pretty different from each other. So some different perspectives. Hope it'll be kind of fun and seems thematic this time of year. And uh, we'll end at the end of the month on October 30th and a special challenge for you to wear a t-shirt or a sweatshirt from your alma mater. Uh, that Sunday. So uh, where, where are your colors? And if you don't want to do that, just pick a team. Uh, uh, wear, wear, wear something uh, that when wear it proudly. All right, here's a homecoming story. This one you may not be as familiar with. I'm going to give you some background a little bit later in the message. Uh, but here are these words now from the book of Nehemiah. I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. And I'm just going to go ahead and apologize right before I begin that there are a lot of very unfamiliar names to pronounce in here. So if you're wondering, yes, of course I pronounced it correctly, okay? All right. Nehemiah 8. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early in the morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and all who could understand. When it says there, and all who could understand, just so you know, we believe that he's talking about there were children or, or young adults who were old enough to be able to comprehend what was going on. So men, women, and children were gathered for this event. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on the wooden platform that had been made for this purpose. Then beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masaiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Melchinajah, and Hashem, and Hash. Badanah and Zechariah and Meshaluam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achub, Shabbat and I, Hodiah, Masaiah, Kelita, Zeriah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites. Help. 
<laughs> All those were perfect. Help the people <laughs> to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So they read from the book from the law of God with interpretation. They gave them sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, this is the holy day of the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink of the sweet wine, and send portions of them for those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and so do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, two weeks ago when we had our celebration Sunday, it coincided with uh, my college reunion, our 20-year class reunion. I actually graduated 22 years ago, but it was bumped back a couple of years because of COVID. And while I was not able to be in attendance, I, of course, went on social media and I was eager to, to see about the festivities. What had happened? Who showed up? Uh, you know, see some, some class photos. Funny thing is, is, uh, you know, I was very grateful for the fact that nearly everybody now carries a high-definition camera in their pocket that you can zoom in and even maybe get name tags if you're lucky in some of these class photos because I didn't recognize a ton of people. Now, of course, the natural response is, oh, that must be somebody's spouse, but it probably wasn't, honestly, in some of those pictures. They're just some people that I, they've, I don't remember them or they look totally different and I didn't recognize them anymore. But I did have a friend who was passing through Birmingham, as it happens, last week, and he came and stayed with us for a couple of nights, and he was able to go to the reunion. And uh, he told me, you know, about some things that he learned about, here's what happened to so-and-so, told me about some of the changes that had happened on the college campus, and isn't it, isn't it always true that right after you graduate, the school makes all these great improvements that you wish you could have enjoyed? That happened. Uh, the, the, the small town where the college exists had a, a bunch of things change over too. And, uh, and interestingly, predictably, people fell back into their old routines. I mean, they went back to their alma mater and went to their favorite pizza place that they used to go to on Friday night, hung out with the same people on Saturday night. You know, uh, the old relationships, the old inside jokes, the old stories got told again and again, just seems like it was predictable in exactly what happened. But that's part of what's special about a homecoming. It's the going back to what was so familiar to us. It has shaped us. It has, in many ways, made us who we are uh, and left a, a lasting impression on us. And so when we go back, we can't help but just sort of get swept back up into all of that stuff again. Most of it good, I hope. But those are the things that we get brought back to. It's almost like a, a time warp that takes us back again. And I think that that's what, for many of us, makes homecoming celebrations so special. Speaking more broadly than that, I also think about the homecomings that happen every time I go back to home, to go to the, to the town I grew up in. When I think about, you know, home for me, I guess it's, I don't know if that'll ever change, but for home for me will, will be the place that I spent my, my childhood years those kind of memories in, in a house that has now been sold and then I think sold again. But, but that's where I, I think of when I think about home. It was those years that I spent late elementary school, junior high, high school. To me, that was all in the same place. And when I go back home, it's funny how the way I relate to my parents somehow changes just because I'm back home again. Or the way that I uh, am in relationships with my sisters uh, somehow it sort of changes. Just being honest, I feel like we regress a little bit. Uh, we kind of go back into more childish kind of ways and interactions again and, and responding to each other in that kind of way. And when I, when I watch my wife and her brother doing the same kind of thing, I say, well, maybe this is, this is kind of normal, that we just sort of fall into these patterns. We were talking about this a little bit at a staff meeting of the day, and, and one of our staff members 
volunteered that one of the, the most unusual parts of homecoming for her involves when she goes back to her parents' house that there are rules again that haven't applied for a long period of time. She says that the rule that her brother is challenged by is that he has a, a, a girlfriend that he has been with for years and they live together and when they go back to home, to mom and dad's house, that girlfriend has to stay in the guest room. And I said, well, that, you know, I, could, I see that happening. That happened in a lot of houses that I'm familiar with, right? It would happen in my house. And she said, but that's not the, the, the unusual one. The unusual one is that we have a nine o'clock curfew. And I said, nine? Well, that, that is something for people in their 30s and their 40s to have a nine o'clock curfew. But okay, I guess it's uh, their house, their rules. And then I thought about it for a second. And I thought, yeah, I guess at this point in life, I'm cool being in by nine too. So maybe that's not that big of a deal. But, but as I was thinking about these rules, and, you know, when you think about sort of the rules that you grew up under, at some point in life, they don't really feel oppressive anymore like they might have when you were a kid. You know, rules around things like curfews or guest rooms, I mean, let's feel more like expectations. It, it almost sets the tone for this is what's expected under this roof. If you're going to stay here, you will abide by these under these terms. They don't feel oppressive. They feel like respectful. They feel helpful. They, they sort of set parameters. They help you remember where you are, who you are, where you came from, what shaped you. It's homecoming type stuff. I share all that because I hope that that provides a little bit of context for this passage that I just read from Nehemiah. Yes, there were a lot of very confusing and hard to pronounce names in there. And the point, though, is the story that exists around the rattling off of all those names. Let me give you a little bit of background. So we have talked several times this year about the period of exile. So when the southern kingdom of Judah, this is the Jewish people living in the southern kingdom, are finally not able any longer to, to turn away the Babylonians. And the Babylonians come in, there's this mighty empire, and they come in and they sack the southern kingdom of Judah, they lay siege to the city of Jerusalem, and they tear down the walls, they burn up the temple, they take everything worth taking, and then they take the people out of there and they scatter them throughout the empire. They are deliberately trying to assimilate them into Babylonian culture by removing the cultures that they came from. So it didn't matter who they were conquering, that was their MO. They would go in and they would take the people and they would scatter them and try to disorient them so that they were no longer who they were, but who they were becoming as Babylonians. Well, the Jewish people managed to stick together during that time period as best they could. Now, some remnant remained behind in Judah, Many others were scattered across the Babylonian Empire. And it was during this time period that some of the Jews said, we can't go back and worship at the temple like we used to for generations. That was who we are. That was critical to our understanding of our community and our, and our worship practices. So now what do we do here? And this is the time and this is the era where the synagogue is born. Basically the idea that you worship somewhere else as a satellite of the temple back in Jerusalem, but now you are worshiping with a smaller group wherever you are located. And so that's how that whole movement began. Well, the Babylonians can't run things forever and now the Persians rise up as the superpower and the Persians come in and they sack the Babylonians. And the Persians, have a little bit more of an open-minded attitude to the Jews in their empire. And so they said, yeah, you can worship again. It's okay. You can, you can even go back if you want to and go back to Judah and Jerusalem. So one day, there's this Persian king. We talked about him about a month ago named Artaxerxes. He has a servant named Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a cup bearer by trade. He, he brings beverages to the king whenever the king beckons him. Nehemiah comes in. He looks forlorn one day. Artaxerxes says, Nehemiah, why do you look so sad? You are always so happy and upbeat whenever you come into my presence. What's going on? And he says, my heart is heavy. I'm thinking about my community back home. Now, Nehemiah has never lived back there, mind you. It's been a couple of generations now since the people lived there. But he's told the stories 
he's reminded of his culture and where he came from. And he says, that's where I identify as home. And I'd like to go back there and I'd like to begin to rebuild the wall around my temple. And once that's fortified, we can begin to restore the temple again and we can have a sense of community and pride in that place and rally the people together again. And somehow Artaxerxes says, okay, I'll give you my stamp of approval. You can take some supplies. Go ahead, go do it. So Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem. He surveys the area, it says it's a mess, and he begins to recruit people to help build the wall again, to set up shop and to establish permanent residency again in this place. Finally, the wall is built. And the day has finally come when he says something now needs to happen. It feels like we're getting closer, but we're not really back on our feet again. This isn't exactly what we're meant to be going forward. There's something missing in our community. We need something to rally us together. We need to bring us and together, galvanize our group. And so he enlists the help of a scribe and a priest named Ezra, who has the book before Nehemiah is in the Bible. And the two men build this wooden structure, like a little, a little uh, riser. And they set up outside the gate and they rally all the people and they bring them in and they say, we have something that we want to do. And so it's these two men along with all those other people that were named in the passage and they line up on this little dais and they stand up there and they say, here's what we're going to do. We are going to open the book of the law and we are going to take as long as it takes today to read this from start to finish. But remember, while that sounds like an incredibly dull moment, the book of the law to the Jewish people is what God gave to Moses. And Moses then shared with the people. And as he shared this with the people, it established some identity that they had as a culture. These are the practices. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. This is how we live, this is how we worship, this is how we sacrifice, this is how we give, this is how we share. All of these things are encompassed in the reading of the law. And so it's time now, we said we brought the community back together, we have been separate, we have been apart, we've been scattered far and wide, we are here now, we built the wall around us, we are reconstituting the temple, and we are going to stand right here and we are going to read this set of laws because it will help remind us who we are, where we come from, whose we are as a people, and it will be our guiding voice to build our future upon. This is our homecoming. And so they stand up there and they read the law and it takes all morning into the early afternoon before they finish it. And as they conclude, the people have been standing the whole time out of reverence for hearing the law read. And they applaud and they say, amen. Amen, meaning so be it, so be it. But the two men, Ezra and Nehemiah, look out and they see there's not a dry eye in the congregation. Now we may be wondering, well, what, what is that about? You've just been read the laws, the regulations, the rule book. Who, nobody cries at the rule book. Except in this case, they realized how far they had drifted from what God told Moses that they should be. Now, they might have felt bad about that, but I guess I have a little bit of sympathy for them. I mean, there was a lot of things that maybe they did wrong and some things that they could have done better, but there was also a lot that was beyond their control. They didn't control that the evil Babylonians came in. They didn't, they didn't control the fact that the Babylonians had this practice of separating people from their communities and from their families. It was something beyond their control that, that sent them all out to different areas. They were living in seclusion or in isolation from each other. When they came together to worship, they had to do so remotely. It was a tough time period and the people felt disconnected. They felt all out of sorts. And even when they came back together and had the project of, of, of the construction of the wall, still something was missing. Does this sound familiar?
they needed to be reminded about who they were, where they came from, what their common story was, where God was leading them from here, what comes next. And the remnant that existed in that moment was not the same group that was there beforehand. But this was the group that faithfully said, this is our time to remember this story. This is our time to recommit. This is a time to put down new roots in this place and to do something special and to listen for where God is leading us to go next. It was a powerful moment. One that was obviously filled with lots of emotion and so the people were weeping in this situation. But Ezra and Nehemiah looked out at the congregation and said, we see you weeping, but don't, don't. God is doing a new thing at this moment. Don't you see that you are here today because God has been faithful? Don't you see that God is writing a new chapter in our story and God has not abandoned us? We are able to be here today because of God's faithfulness. We are able to be here today because we have persevered. We are able to be here today to recite these words, to remember this story, to remember our place in it, and to declare this moment as a homecoming and the start of something new and special. I visited with a couple from this church recently, actually, and they said, you know, We came back to church because we realized that no matter where we turned, everywhere else in our lives, something was missing. These are their actual words. They said, we had great jobs. We thought it was because we wanted a child and then we had a child. We ended up in a secure house. We feel supported by our family. We've got a great network of Friends, we have everything that we could ask for and there's still something that's missing. We realize that that was active involvement in church. That was our faith that had taken a back seat to everything else. Everything else was, it became an issue of as soon as we get this in place, then we'll get back into the practice of worshiping and participating in church again. Well, as soon as we get that thing taken care of, then we'll get back into the practice. And what happened was, is that they just said, nope, it's gotta be time. And they started and they went back and they got involved and they said, and we realized that this was in fact the piece that felt missing. So homecoming for us is not just about where we've been, it also is about recommitment. It's about remembering that these things have helped shape us and make us who we are, and we have fond memories of them because those things were important to us. But we hang on to those things and we help write the next chapter in our lives in them, and we take that stuff that is most important. And I would say to you that, that you're here today because you have realized too that this part about a community of faith, about worship, about digging into scripture, about being challenged in your faith and about not just letting things go by, you realize is important. And I applaud you for that. And as we included parts in our worship service today like singing the doxology and reciting the Apostles' Creed is a reminder of those things that unify us that call us back together again in these moments of homecoming, that are cause for celebration, are cause for joy. And we wipe our eyes and we look at the blessings that we have and together we write the next chapter of where God is leading us as grace, as individuals, as the United Methodist Church, and as Christ's church universal to be Christ's hands and feet at work in the world. Will you pray with me?